All right, well, good morning. We made it through the week, right? Sort of, I mean, most of us. Well, that's good. Um, so my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. And I uh, just want to let you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start out with a little disclaimer. I'm pretty amped up today. Um, I, I ha- this message is sort of burning in my bones, if you will. And so uh, there's going to be a bit of excitement. So whether, so ready or not, uh, here, here I come, right? So hopefully you're, you're, you're ready for it. I think what God wants to share with us is uh, really good for us right now. But I think for me, what I needed was an experience with God over the last two days. And I had it. Um, I, I, I needed God, to, I needed to encounter God in a real, tangible way through all of this mayhem over the last nine months. Um, there, there just been kind of a decrease in, I guess, my uh, enthusiasm, if you will. We're going to talk about that today a little bit. But I found something in Scripture and then had, had a, an amazing encounter with God over the weekend that, that I want to... Uh, I want to breathe into you, and so I hope I hope that's okay with you that I do that. Yeah. Um, so so last week we talked about this idea of putting on a certain kind of perspective and attitude, a way, uh, a disposition going into this last week, and I couldn't get one of the scriptures out of my head. It was Colossians three seventeen. And it says, and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. That was, that was one of the key verses that we talked about last week. And this idea of being a representative of Jesus. And I kept thinking throughout the week, it was like the thing that kept circling through my head was, how can I be a representative of Jesus right now? especially with everything that was going on and how prolonged everything was. And I mean, it was just crazy, was it not? And, and so I had to continuously remind myself that I need to rep Jesus right now. I, I, I am a representative of Jesus. I need to make sure that that's who I'm representing right now. And I, I thought about that and I kept, it, it just was circling around in my head over and over again. And it brought me to something else Paul said that was very similar and it's in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. And he says this, So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that Nothing you do for him will be useless. I love that thought. And today we're going to talk from this idea, this title, Place Your Passion. Place Your Passion. So we're going to talk about passion today. We're going to talk about enthusiasm today. And, uh, and I think that that's an important thing for us as Christ followers right now, to make sure that we have properly placed passion. I didn't mean to make that three Ps, but it came out naturally. And I like that. So I'm going to pray and then we'll jump right in. Jesus, we need you so much today. It's my prayer every day when I wake up. Jesus, I need you. Because it's true, every moment of my life, everything I do, I need you. And, uh, and we need you today more than ever before. And so I ask today that you would Perhaps do something in our hearts. Holy Spirit, that you'd move throughout the hearts of the people in this building, of the people watching online, that you would engage something that maybe has been lost or stagnant. That you would engage a passion for you and stoke a flame today. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sorry if baby shark is stuck in your head, but I'm hearing it through the auditorium. Uh, So... (laughs) Eli and I, my son Elijah, we love the WWE. We love to watch it together. Uh, and, and however you might feel about me after I say that, that's okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm safe with, uh, with the feeling that, that you're okay with that. Um, we, we love to watch the WWE. And this came from, uh, I used to watch it with my dad when I was, uh, you know, when I was Eli's age. 
I would watch the WWF at that time uh, with, with my dad. And, and then I, I watched it all the way through my high school years, and, um, and maybe or maybe not, I may or may not confirm that we may have done some backyard wrestling. Um, I said may or may not confirm. And, uh, and I, I will say that those late years of the 1990s were the best years of the WWF. And then it changed to WWE shortly after that. But that's not really what I'm talking about today. So uh, I remember a, a few years ago, Eli and I were able to go to his first WWE event at the Moda Center. And, um, and, and it was my first as well. So we got to experience this together. And what was, uh, I mean, if this was one of the coolest experiences that I've ever had. Seriously, whether you like it or not, like, you know, like the WWE or not, the, their live experience is, is like nothing else. It's totally interactive. You're interacting with the fans. You're interacting with the, the wrestlers. I mean, all sorts of stuff. And it's, it's super, super cool. And I, I remember it, was only, it only took about five minutes for Eli to completely lose his voice because he was screaming at the top of his lungs from the moment that we entered the arena. Um, but, and of course we were both just, just freaking out at different things and I felt like a kid again. And, and then like the music hit for one of, one of the old wrestlers that I used to watch made a return that night after like five years or something like that. And so I'm like this little kid and I had my phone out. I recorded it. I don't even know. I, I tried to find it. I couldn't find it because I knew you guys would love to watch it, but I'm sure if my wife was here, she would find it and bring it around to everybody. But I, so, so I was I, I, I remember, like, I was a little kid again, you know, this, this five-year-old kid screaming at the top of my lungs because this wrestler made a return, right? And, and it got me thinking about passion. And, and, you know, I don't know, maybe you've been to a sporting event or something along those lines where you will shout at the top of your lungs, you will, I mean, you'll be, the enthusiasm will seep out of every part of you, right? And I don't know what that is for you. Um, you know, some people are into sports. Sometimes it's, it's a movie or what, whatever. But just something that gives you that passion to, to just, just let it all out. And when I think about passion, right, it's this intense driving conviction. It's like this, uh, this devotion to an activity or an object or a concept. There, there's this, this longing of your heart to, to be a part of this thing. It's, it's the thing you're passionate about. And everybody's kind of passionate about different things. And um, I wonder if you've ever come to a place where you feel like you've misplaced your passion. Have you ever been there? Where like, I used to have a passion for something, and I'm not necessarily talking about God. We'll, we'll get there, of course. But, but I just want maybe the sense that, that maybe you've lost your passion for something. That once you just felt like this was the only thing on earth that could make you happy or give you uh, something to, to be enthusiastic about, but now I'm not so sure anymore. Maybe, maybe you've been there. You, you feel like you've misplaced your passion. And, uh, and I, I was thinking about what does it look like to misplace your passion. When I first met Jesus, I was 14. And, uh, and I didn't know about God, really. I mean, we, we had little mentions in my home about God and stuff like that. But I, I didn't really, like, I didn't necessarily believe in him. I didn't, I didn't have any conviction that God was real or any of that kind of stuff. I, I, just, I just was kind of going through the motions and all that. And, uh, and I remember when I first met Jesus, and, and I just had this overwhelming passion for him. Because I literally had, had gone from death to life. And I felt it. Like I just knew it. All of a sudden I was seeing things differently. My, uh, uh, the, the way I was thinking about life was different. And I was constantly devouring the Bible. I mean, I, I was in it every day, sometimes hours at a time. Just devouring the words 
that were in front of me and thinking about them and processing them. And I remember writing down stuff in my journal because that's I, I'm a journaler. And I just I, I'm writing down thoughts and ideas and questions. And I would constantly ask questions to my youth pastor. I'm sure that at some point he was like, man, is this guy ever going to stop asking questions? And I didn't. I, I was literally like always kind of on the phone with him or if we were at youth group or whatever, I was always asking him questions about God. Because I was at this, this beginning, right? This, this place where, man, I, I love God. I, I love this thing. I, I just, I want to know more about it. And it, it was this desire that, uh, that was insatiable. I couldn't get enough of, of who God was. And, uh, and, and I remember this feeling of discovering a purpose in my life. Can you think back to that? Maybe for you, that, that moment that you met Jesus for the first time. That, that moment where you knew the story was real. That it was no longer a fairy tale to you or something that maybe people used as a crutch, as some, some have been known to say. But you knew at that moment, this is real. Jesus is real. And I need to put my faith in Him. And you did. And something changed in your heart. And a passion arose for you about who Jesus was. I was telling my friends all the time. I was seeing my friends get saved left and right. Right, Mom? Friends coming into my house getting saved left and right. Coming into the youth group. I mean, it was just the passion. Now, I'm not saying that my desire for those things has diminished. But there are certainly times where I can see that my passion for God may be down the rung a little bit on my passion for some other things. Is it okay if I talk real in church? Is that right? Like, this idea that it is not that my desire for God ever weaned, or ever waned, is the right word, but, but the enthusiasm, maybe the passion waned. And I started asking myself a question. Why? Why is my enthusiasm, my passion for God waning? Why is it not what it was when I first met Jesus? Why ha have circumstances in life and, and things around kind of allowed that to come down a couple rungs? And my passion for other things has risen to the top perhaps. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you're there. Maybe you're at a place where your passion has diminished. Where you, you would say, Matt, I really want to get my passion back. I want my enthusiasm for God to be the first thing on my mind. I want my passion for God to be first. You might be there. And maybe you've never had a passion for Jesus. Maybe you're in here wondering or online watching, wondering if Jesus is even real. And you're asking yourself that question. I want a passion for God, but I don't know how to get there. And if that's you today, then this message is for you. If that's you in any way, even if it's just a little bit, this message is for you. And if you've got all the passion still, this message is still for you. Because there will come a time when the cares of this life and the things can make it go down just a little bit. And we have to remember one specific thing that we're going to talk about today in order to get that passion back. So you guys interested in that? Okay. So here's the deal. We had, um, although we have plenty of clapping, don't worry. You, 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 we'll, we'll get there. Um, so, you know, David asked, I, I don't know if you, you remember this, but David, King David, made, he, he had a, a tremendous low spot in his life where he committed adultery, killed the guy, killed the guy's uh, husband, killed the lady's husband. Wow, I, I can't even. He committed adultery and killed the lady's husband so that he could make her his, his wife. Uh, pretty low spot. And he wrote this when he was in his low spot. He said, God, renew to me the joy of my salvation. Renew to me the joy of of my salvation. In Revelation, he talks to the Ephesian church, Jesus writing a letter to the Ephesian church. And he says to them, you've done a lot of great things, a lot of great things in my name. But 
this one thing I hold against you. You've forgotten your first love. So you've done a lot, but you forgot your first love. There's a passion that's missing. And these are important things to think about when we want to get our passion back, that there were people in the Bible that the same thing happened to them, and they had to get themselves out. So let's get it today, yeah? Let's get it today. All right, so when you think of passion, you can also think about enthusiasm, right? And, and this, there's, there's a really cool thing about the word enthusiasm. Uh, Pastor Caleb brought this to me a long time ago, and it changed, it, it changed my life, changed my, my whole mindset on even the word enthusiasm, what it means, all of that. It's actually from a Greek word, entheos, which means the spirit of God within. That's what enthusiasm, so when we are enthusiastic about something, it actually means that we're inspired by the spirit of God within us into action. That's, to be enthusiastic is to be so filled with passion by the Holy Spirit that then it comes out in what's called enthusiasm. And this enthusiasm is so important, and, and, and I love this idea, but look, let's read again in 1 Corinthians 15 at this idea, but I'm going to go back to verse 57, which I didn't read earlier. It says this, but thank God, He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if there's anybody in here today that is thankful for that. But thank God that he gave, he gave us victory over sin and death, right? That is where the enthusiasm comes from. Okay? We have to start there. It wasn't just that he said that Paul was saying, be enthusiastic, do, do the work for God enthusiastically. He says, there's a place where that enthusiasm comes from. And it's a gratefulness for the fact that Jesus beat sin and death. And that is an amazing place for our enthusiasm to start from, is it not? Our passion should flow from that place. And I, I, I love that thought. And so here's the deal. We remember the reason for our enthusiasm, and that helps us in verse 58. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. It helps us to be strong and immovable in that. The fact that we know this, that Jesus conquered sin and death, gives us the confidence to be strong and immovable. And then it says, always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. So first we remember the reason for the enthusiasm, but secondly... Whom our enthusiasm is toward will actually create the passion that we exhibit. So, you, you'll recognize that in this verse, it's always work enthusiastically for who? For the Lord, right? For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. See, the enthusiasm is both from Him and to him. It all, it all circles around him. We get the enthusiasm from him, and we give it back to him. Make sense? And so it's that, that, that idea that, that God, he conquered sin and death, and now I'm returning praise back to him and gratefulness back to him, and, and nothing we do in, from that space will ever be useless. And I love that. Um, we have a value here at Rhapsody. It's with wholehearted passion. That's, that's, what we, that's, the, that's, the, that's the words for the value. With wholehearted passion. Uh, Caleb has, has been known to quote John, the famous theologian John Wesley, who said, light yourself on fire with passion, and people will come from miles away to see you burn. I love that quote. And then we, were at a, we were at a staff meeting one day, and I said, I said, hey, let's take that a step further. Let's let that fire catch onto other people so we can all burn together. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. 
But this idea of enthusiasm in what we do, right? We, when we ser- what we're doing here is we're serving God and serving each other. And when we do that, we want to do that with passion. We want to do that with enthusiasm. Because there's something good about doing that. It, it's worthy of our enthusiasm, right? And so we place the value around it that what we do, we want to do with wholehearted passion. We want, because it's, it's contagious. Enthusiasm is contagious. And, uh, and so we need to make sure our enthusiasm is placed correctly. Yeah? If it's that important, we have to make sure our enthusiasm is placed correctly. You know, you might wonder why uh, we ask you to do certain things. Like, sometimes you'll hear Caleb or Jess say, I want you to give God a shout of praise. Right? We don't just ask that because we want a bunch of shouting in the room. We, we ask you to do that because it actually does something in your heart. It actually does something in your soul. Why, why do I love it when you amen, right? Or when you say, yeah, that's good, or wow, or whatever you say when you respond. Because when you verbally respond with your mouth or this... You are not only agreeing with what's being said, you're actually engaging your senses in what's being said. That's why it's so important that you become part of this experience. This is not just me talking to you. This is God talking to us. And when, when that's happening, we have to, we're engaging together in that. And there has to be some great enthusiasm around that. That's, that's why. That's why I'm constantly kind of just jabbing you guys saying, I need to hear from you. I need to, I need to know that you're engaged because we're engaging together with God. And that, that is so vital and so important. Our, our enthusiasm has to be placed correctly. So I'm wondering today if we could take an assessment, each of us. Take an assessment and an honest one. Where is my passion placed? Let's place our passion. You know, if I really am being honest, where is my passion for God on the list? And if we can be honest, it's a great place to start. Because then we can actually come to an, an honest assessment and say, okay, here's the things maybe I need to do in order to bring that up and be enthusiastic about God the way that I need to be enthusiastic about Him. We have to be honest, though. What, so, so in other words, what are some of your passions? You don't have, I don't want you to respond here. This is rhetorical. Because then a bunch of people are going to feel bad, and I don't want that to happen. So, so, so you, you need to rhetorically think about those things, take an assessment of those passions that you have, and put them in place. And then look at those where they're placed and ask yourself, are they, are they properly placed? Are these properly placed passions, or are they misplaced? We can only do that when we're being honest. And so we, we can do this. And, and I want to say that our passion, when it's misplaced, it's normally on a thing. Our passion has to be on a person. And his name's Jesus, by the way. It's always the answer. We have to properly place our passion on a person. His name is Jesus. Now, I see a lot of passion out there, right? There's a lot of passion in the world right now. There's passion for a position that you hold. There's passion for what you're against. Tons of passion on what we're against. Lots. There's passion in politicians, candidates, right? There's Tons of passion around platforms, sports teams, things like that, right? Tons of passion placed on those. But, and I'm not saying those things are necessarily bad unless they're improperly placed. So if those passions are here and our passion for God is here, we have to reassess that especially uh, in our current climate. And so, let's assess it. Let's think about it. 
We've got to be passionate about the person of Jesus. And we can be because He's passionate about us. He's so passionate about us. We see it on the cross, right? We see it on the fact that He came down from heaven into humanity. Took on flesh and died in our place. We see the passion that He has for us. And it's from that place of His passion for us that we can have and return passion to Him. And and knowing that He has that kind of passion helps us to move that forward. And if, if Jesus is our first passion, then His Holy Spirit inside of us will help us have passion for the right things, yeah? It'll help us have passion for the, for the people in our lives. In other words, if we love the Lord our God with all, everybody say all, right? All our heart, soul, mind, and strength. All of it. Wholehearted devotion to God and love for Him. That's the kind of passion that we need to have for Him. And then when we have that kind of love for God, then what happens? We love our neighbor as ourself, yeah? So when our passion for God is first place, He puts the right things in place below that. Always. And so we have to start with our passion for Him. I want to read to you John 20, the story of when Jesus comes back from the grave and enters into the house of the disciples who are waiting to see what's next. They don't know. They're disappointed. And look what it says. John 20, verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. They were locked in a room, afraid, disappointed, disillusioned, unsure of the future. I wonder if that sounds familiar to any of you. Maybe you feel locked in a room, afraid, disappointed, unsure of what the future will hold. I wonder what would happen if we recognized that suddenly Jesus can appear. Before I move forward, I want to pause. And I want to talk to those of you who have never put your faith in Jesus. I want to start there because, you know, so many times, we, we have a lot of Christian cliches, don't we? Man, do we have some Christian cliches. And there's this one in particular that I understand where it comes from, and it's great. It's intended well. But it's that Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. I've heard this one. Now, it's great. I get it. Because he does that. But you know what's great about our God? What's great about our God is that his pursuit of us is not held back by a locked door. That the way he pursues us is not just that he knocks at the door of our heart. Sometimes when the door's locked, maybe your door's locked. Maybe you've had your door locked for a long time to God. And you've said, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And you lock the door. There are times when Jesus just appears in your house. Where, where you can't do anything, right? You, you don't have the willpower to even open the door if he knocked. That might be where you're at today. 
that even if He knocked at the door of your heart, you wouldn't be able to answer the door because you're afraid and disappointed and unsure. Well, Jesus will suddenly appear in your house and show you the scars on His hand and in His side. And He'll say, He'll give you the faith you need. He'll give you the faith you need. So right now, possibly for the first time in your life, you've had your door locked to Jesus and suddenly you're feeling this faith. And you don't know what that's about. (laughs) Where's this coming from? Well, it's His gift to you. He's giving you the faith to then reach out to Him and respond. And so I want to give you that opportunity to respond today. If you're in this room or if you're watching online, and you would say, Jesus just entered the room. And I want to give you the opportunity to confess that that's what's happening, that that Jesus is God, that he, He died for your sins, that you can be saved today. And if that's you and and you're just feeling that faith right now, I just want you to repeat this. This is your confession. Your confession in in realizing that, that Jesus has defeated death and sin for you. And that you can live. You can have eternal life. And your confession to Him is simply this. Jesus, I give you my life. I just want you to say that right now. If you're on the other side or if you're here, Jesus, I give you my life. And today, perhaps for the first time, you can know with a surety that you have eternal life in Him. You have eternal life in Him. I love, uh, I love Jesus, obviously. Um, but I love this passage of Scripture because they're meeting behind a locked door. And these disciples, they had, you know, they had, they had faith in who he was. But then when stuff went sideways, they weren't sure. They wondered, was he really who he said he is? Did, I mean, did all, all those claims, all those things he said, was it, was it even real? And suddenly he appeared in the room. Suddenly he appeared in the room. And it says that, that once Jesus showed them his hands and showed them his side, they realized in that moment that he was alive, that this wasn't a ghost, right? This was Jesus in the flesh come back to life. They had watched him die, and he was alive. They had watched him die, and he was alive. And in that moment, Scripture says they were overjoyed. This word here means they literally were beside themselves with excitement. Some translations say glad. That's just not good enough. They weren't glad. They were beside themselves with joy because they realized that Jesus was alive. That he had conquered sin and death. Am I right? I'm wondering maybe if there's one, two, maybe three people that might stand to their feet and get a little bit like enthusiastically undignified to give God some praise today because He is worthy of it. Because He conquered sin and death. He is alive today. And I know, you know, you can do it at home too. You can do it, I, I, you can wake your neighbors up, right? You could jump up on your bed, I don't know. You, you could dance in your kitchen, do the little Fortnite dance that your kids do. Right? I don't know. And I know you might be in here, you might be like, Matt, I'm not into this, like, enthusiastic thing. Like, I'm a little bit timid. Have you, I'm, I'm a pretty even keel dude, right? Yeah. I mean, I stay, I, stay pretty, I stay pretty even in my life. But if I could scream my face off at a WWE event, and lose my, like, lose my stuff, right? I'm pretty sure that because of who Jesus is, I could lose it a little bit. And, and I'm thinking, I'm wondering, like, 
if you won the lottery right now or you hit the jackpot, I'm thinking you might lose your mind a little bit. I know how I react when my kids are at a baseball or my kids like hit a home run or something, right? I'm just saying, why don't you try it on a little bit and give God some praise today because He's worthy of it. He's worthy of all of our praise. He conquered sin and death. He is no longer in the grave. He is alive today. He is alive today. Renew the joy of our salvation, God. We need you. We need you. Let's praise today with some enthusiasm, yeah? yeah? Let's sing today with a little bit of enthusiasm because God is worthy of our enthusiasm. Would you stand and sing with us? We hope you enjoyed today's message. Here's a link to some of our other messages. And if you were blessed by today's video, would you go to rhapsodychurch.com? It's in our description. And consider partnering with us. Have a great day.